Greenberg. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. This is one of my favorite events. Um, I've been at Children's Now for nine years, and eight of those years have been focused on demyelinating conditions with Dr. Greenberg. And so um, I'm excited to share some things that we're learning. Thank you guys for bearing with me at the hour in the day. I'm pretty sure the research is around sleep, that this is the time of day your brain um, can easily go into a nap state. So um, hopefully this will hold your attention, uh, and we are in the home stretch here. So I'm going to talk today about living with uh, a rare, um, rare disorder and um, thinking beyond the medical components that we um, you know, need to focus on, but thinking about how this affects a person in daily life. And to kick this off, I like to talk a little bit about the role of neuropsychology. Um, for those of you who haven't encountered a neuropsychologist or learned about what this specialty is all about, one of my favorite things I get to tell my pediatric patients is I'm not that kind of doctor, so I'm not a, a physician. I don't do any medical procedures. Um, one patient has uh, coined the no-shot doctor term to describe me, and I will take it. Um, so my role is understanding cognition, emotion, behavior, all of those factors as they relate to medical conditions and as they relate to injury to the central nervous system. My job is to figure out and describe how these conditions may manifest themselves in daily life. So I have a picture here of a girl in a classroom. Um, the idea here is if there is a problem with one of these cognitive domains, one of these brain-based skills, how might that show up in a classroom setting based on her individual cognitive profile and what types of accommodations or you know, modifications could we provide to make sure that she's able to learn and be successful. So this is really the basis of both my clinical and research work. I further identify as a pediatric neuropsychologist, and in our field, we have to be aware that we are dealing with the moving target of a developing brain. And so it's really important for me to understand brain development at the time that I'm assessing a child, but also um, thinking of when a medical condition may have started. At what point in brain development did we get injury to the brain or some sort of change? Because that can really affect developmental trajectories uh, beyond that point. So you've been hearing uh, about our program down in Dallas at Children's and UT Southwestern called the Conquer Program. I've highlighted the word collaboration. I'm privileged to have been a, a founding member and a, a collaborator to an excellent team of specialists. Um, and so this is the majority of our team. I'm still chasing down a few other headshots. Um, the majority of our team in Dallas that bring their own specialized uh, skill set to clinic each Friday when we come together to see our children with these um, conditions. And if you were to visit us on any given Friday, we may look more like this. <laughs> these are the perks of working in a children's hospital, get to dress up on, on occasion. So one thing I like to highlight, I know the font is small here, um, I think something really special happens when we bring a group of specialists together around a common goal. And in our case, this is providing excellent clinical care to our patients. The other thing that we are really focused on is clinical research. So how can we advance the field based on what we're learning sitting across from our patients in clinic? I know a lot of providers will talk about evidence-based treatments, which is really important. Um, and we use the, the research to guide the work that we do in the clinic. But we also learn so much from our patients and families. Um, the conversations I get to have with folks in clinic or at camp or wherever I am hearing these stories, they really drive my research questions when I'm looking at my data and thinking about how these conditions manifest in daily life. And so that bi-directional relationship means so much. Having uh, people who are willing to have their data used for research purposes is huge, but also having patients willing to describe their stories and talk to us um, makes all the difference in the work that we're able to do. In addition, um, these things lead us to do many other activities. And as the years have gone on, 
We've really focused in on um, program development as we uh, discover things that are needed for our patients. Um, Audrey Keach, who's here, developed a transition program for our teens crossing over into the adult world of medical care and for schooling and other uh, reasons. Um, we also do a good bit of community outreach, and um, partnering with the TMA is one way that we do that. So we get to participate in um, podcasts and writing blog posts and going to the, the summer camp. Just a variety of things that we do. Our clinical research le leads to new discoveries that bring us to a place like this to disseminate that information. So I could go on and on, but I just want to acknowledge that um, this teamwork really does enhance what we're able to do for our patients individually, but what we're able to do uh, for the field as a whole. So I wanted to share a little bit with you all about the research discoveries that we're making right now. I'm actually going to share a couple of studies with you that have not yet been presented um, to anyone. And so it's a, an exciting time um, in our research lab, and I, I want to tell you all about that. So we opened our clinic, as we said, uh, about eight years ago. Um, from a neuropsychological research perspective, I will be honest with this crowd, I was very interested in studying these brain-based conditions, conditions you could see on an MRI like you can see here. And I thought, you know, um, very interested in the other conditions, but thought they might serve as a good control group for a variety of reasons. And so uh, moving forward, uh, I thought we could compare, for instance, um, cognitive profiles in individuals with MS who have this chronic brain-based medical condition or relapsing condition um, with uh, cognitive functioning and transverse myelitis. But we had an unexpected finding. Um, we thought that our uh, patients with MS would report more problems with cognition and school performance and that we would see this in our testing. But instead, we saw an equivalent rate of school problems in pediatric patients with TM and pediatric patients with MS, and this really caused us to take a step back. We zoomed in a little bit more and found out that those with transverse myelitis, uh, many of our patients were showing some cognitive problems. As we talk about cognitive dysfunction today, I want to make the point that not everyone with a given medical condition that I'm discussing um, will experience cognitive problems. So we do see this in a subset of the patients, and we're still learning why that might be. So this really caused me to think about things a little bit differently when it comes to my research. So we've started to think about um, MS as serving as a control in rare disease research. And why is this important? Um, so thinking about the literature there, that is out there for MS and adults uh, and children as well, this is a fairly well-established literature that tells us a variety of things. There are cognitive, mood-related, and fatigue symptoms present. Um, this literature is more advanced for adults with MS. Um, the pediatric literature is coming along and is suggesting similar things. So if we know these things about MS and then we could compare to a rare disease, it helps us learn um, what types of challenges our patients with the rare conditions may be having and how that might relate to what's going on um, for individuals with MS. The other piece I really want to highlight here, and I think we have a long way to go in the research, but these symptoms that I'm talking about, and I've listed them you know, individually, the fact is we usually see these symptoms co-occur, and we think that they're really interrelated, and that provides some pretty exciting um, news on the intervention side. So if we are to treat one area, we might also be treating something else, and there is some literature to suggest that. Um, in the MS literature. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples where, where researchers have used MS as a um, control to understand what's going on in other conditions. The short version of this slide is that um, researchers, uh, starting in about 2008, started describing cognitive dysfunction in NMO, when previously we understood NMO as a condition that had relative sparing of the brain. Now, I think that a lot of that comes from not seeing the, the bright lesions on an MRI, um, but research is showing us that actually uh, there is a subset of patients that may be experiencing cognitive problems, and in some cases, 
they look no different than um, MS when we run our statistical analyses. This was a huge uh, discovery in my mind, and as a clinician working with patients with NMO, it really shifted my thinking about what to expect in those individuals. That said, these are adult studies, and so um, we can't automatically translate that to uh, uh, pediatrics. So um, some of these findings are consistent with what we're seeing in our NMO data in children, um, and we are working on that right now um, and hope to be able to report some of that to you next time. Another situation where um, MS was used as a control group was looking at ADEM. And so uh, these are very small sample sizes, as you'll notice. Uh, this was a pediatric uh, cohorts here. Um, and what they found was that overall, uh, those with MS demonstrated greater impairment um, across cognitive domains. And we think this is because of the uh, chronic disease course associated with MS. Um, so ADEM looked pretty good in a lot of areas, but there were a couple of areas where there were some weaknesses. I want to plug a study that's going on right now, um, uh, similar to the NMO questions. We hope to be back to you with um, answers regarding ADEM. There is a, um, a study assessment of pediatric encephalomyelitis related outcomes, understand, reveal, educate, or aperture for short, like our acronyms, conquer, aperture. Um, this study is led by Dr. Cindy Wang, who I just saw a moment ago, and she can answer your questions about that. Um, this is a really exciting study because we are able to track and see how folks are doing over time um, following an ADEM event. So that is underway now. Okay, so I want to shift gears into some uh, new findings we have um, in our clinic. Uh, one of these studies is led by Alexander Tan, who is not here. He is a fourth-year uh, PhD student at UT Southwestern. And one thing I uh, failed to mention earlier in my big slide about the uh, syner synergistic effect of working in teams, um, we also have this very natural environment to teach and train others. So we can teach them clinically and we can teach them um, through their research. And um, Alex is going to defend his dissertation soon and this is um, the subject of his work. What you'll be hearing about today are our preliminary analyses. So I'm still collecting some more data before we uh, finalize that work. So this goes back to that original question I had when I first came into the clinic. What would the profiles of uh, pediatric MS and TM uh, look like when we compare them? How might they be different? So that was our aim um, in this particular study, would be to compare those and also characterize two profiles. Um, one, neurocognitive. So that's how folks do on that uh, performance-based measures of attention, memory, processing speed, things like that. And we also wanted to look at the psychosocial profiles. I mentioned earlier, mood-related symptoms are um, well documented in MS. And we wanted to, we had hypotheses about TM, but we wanted to see how they would compare. So psychosocial profiles refers to um, Basically, data we derive from questionnaires, both from uh, parents and uh, the patients themselves. So we did this through uh, an IRB-approved protocol. Um, 39 pediatric patients diagnosed with MS were included, and 33 uh, diagnosed with TM. So uh, most all of our patients coming through clinic will complete a brief neuropsychological battery of tests and also complete some questionnaires, and so we looked at that data. Um, it's also important to note that those we included in the study were at least 30 days from acute symptoms um, and also steroid treatment. So a lot of words on this slide. Um, I want you to know that our uh, cognitive evaluation lasts about an hour and um, includes these domains. These are domains of functioning thought to be particularly vulnerable for individuals um, who've experienced a demyelinating event. Um, processing speed, uh, we do a lot with um, looking at fine motor um, coordination, how well uh, folks integrate visual and motor um, skills. And then uh, skills related to attention, uh, memory, that's a big one. So I'm going to um, show you also the questionnaires that we had um, our uh, patients and families fill out. And these really focus mostly on um, emotional functioning, quality of life, and a few other areas. 
So um, Alex has chosen a rather sophisticated statistical method that we're all learning about right now with the support of um, our statistics uh, experts, experts back at UT. So profile analysis really allows us to take um, two groups and look at uh, cognitive profiles, psychosocial profiles, and see how those are different, and then what variables might be driving um, the results that we're seeing. So um, cognitively, what we saw were that um, the model here was statistically significantly different. So um, one of our hypotheses was given the um, nature of MS, that it is this relapsing condition that is attacking the brain, um, we, we thought that we might see um, more cognitive problems in that group. And so that is what this model suggests. I'm going to orient you to this because it's there's a lot going on here. So um, the purple line represents mean scores of the MS group in a variety of domains. And I've labeled a few of them to highlight for you today. But these numbers represent uh, different performance-based measures. Here on the side are standard scores. Um, a standard score has an average of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And what that means is a score from 85 to 115, so 15 points on either side, would represent the broad average range. So uh, we said purple is the MS group, green uh, the TM group. So overall, we're seeing that transverse myelitis patients are looking um, better on the performance-based cognitive tasks. Um, I will draw your attention to uh, a place where they dip below the MS group and the mean score for, um, excuse me, <laughs> for auditory attention. And this is a finding we've had uh, for a while now. We published a paper uh, about some of this a while back. Auditory attention, the ability to hear information one time and repeat it back. So if someone gives a list of um, instructions or a, a phone number, um, and being able to hold that in mind without repetition, that seems to be a weaker area uh, for our patients with transverse myelitis. Processing speed is one of the things that is uh, most well documented when it comes to MS. So I wanted to highlight that, um, that we see that there's a, a pretty big gap there um, and that our patients with transverse myelitis are looking better in that regard. Then you see over here, these are fine motor tasks. So one thing we have documented over time is folks with transverse myelitis may have um, some difficulty with fine motor skills, but again, relative to MS, uh, look better. This is our psychosocial um, profile analysis. And I, um, what is really striking, and I want everyone to really take this in, there were no significant differences in psychosocial profiles. And that is major. That is major for so many reasons. It's major to a, a psychologist working in the clinic with these patients. Because as I said before, it's well established in MS that we see um, mood-related changes and um, changes relative to quality of life. So this tells me that, um, you know, uh, our patients with transverse myelitis are experiencing some similar things, um, so much so that there wasn't a statistically significant difference. So I get a lot of questions around mood. Um, the mood symptoms we tend to see are those that are internalizing, um, you know, meaning not... Uh, really very observable, um, so anxiety, depression. Um, and these symptoms can manifest themselves differently across individuals, but certainly differently in children versus adults. Um, and so I wanted to draw your attention to that uh, particular finding here. Um, attention problems were also um, included in this model um, as based on parent report. So we saw, um, again, no differences there. If you look to the right, of our um, graph here, quality of life. So remember, uh, transverse myelitis is represented in green. This is an area where it dips well below um, our uh, participants with um, MS. And so that's um, also a really significant finding um, for, for our clinic. So the conclusions here um, 
are that our patients with transverse myelitis uh, relative to MS are looking uh, better cognitively, but that doesn't mean that we're completely off the hook. Um, we do know, and another way to have described this would have been to look at the rate of impairment, so how many people in that cohort were experiencing uh, deficits, say, in attention or memory, and that is something that we are working on and, as I mentioned, had um, published a little while ago. So we know that there are some um, subtle cognitive differences or difficulties that our patients with TM are facing, and this really informs um, what we're able to do in the way of treatment plans, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Again, psychosocial profiles are not significantly different. This work is really advancing our understanding of outcomes associated with these rare conditions. So I'm going to um, point out uh, Mr. Cole Haig here in the back. Um, he's here at this meeting um, and will be happy to answer questions about his work that I'm going to uh, present now. So uh, Cole is a third year PhD student at UT Southwestern. He and I have worked together since he came uh, to the program years ago, and he um, has done a lot of work in our uh, research lab on uh, transverse myelitis, and then in this case, comparing um, MS and TM relative to fatigue, okay? So um, talk to him this weekend um, if you'd like. I mentioned earlier that we had this unexpected finding in our TM work, and we published this information, but one of our conclusions um, actually raised more questions. That's what uh, good research does, is raise more questions for you to pursue in the next study. So one of those questions was about the role of fatigue in cognitive dysfunction. We had a, a high rate um, of patients and parents re reporting fatigue, and so um, this is the basis of Cole's work, um, really looking at this. The other point we made earlier is uh, fatigue is a well-established symptom in MS. It's actually considered one of the most frequent and debilitating symptoms of MS. We're seeing something similar in our pediatric literature. Um, when you combine it, about 75% uh, of patients with pediatric MS are reporting fatigue. One more point to make here, I mentioned earlier, many of these symptoms are um, interrelated. So stemming from the work on cognitive functioning in TM, uh, we're wondering about how uh, fatigue may be influencing those patients when they are um, trying to perform on a cognitive task. So the study objective um, here was simply to compare fatigue symptoms between groups, and this was based on um, self-report, parent report of fatigue. And this involved a sample of 41 patients with MS and 37 with TM. We looked at, um, we used this form, so um, these are the uh, dimensions that we we're evaluating. So general fatigue, um, just generally feeling tired, maybe having trouble finishing things, also sleep rest fatigue, so how this might um, show up in terms of sleep patterns, and then cognitive fatigue. So this really pulls for things like problems with attention and memory and so forth. So we found a significant difference between groups, but there's more. Um, what we found was MS and TM groups did not differ when it came to sleep and general fatigue, but they did differ relative to cognitive fatigue. And that may make some sense, right, if, um, if MS is a um, you know, chronic brain-based condition, um, and as we just saw in previous slides, tends to manifest uh, with more cognitive impairment. This is a slide depicting this here, and so you can see um, MS is in blue, TM is in green, and um, low scores uh, just mean more problems. So you can see that here. So this is the first study that we're aware of that demonstrated that pediatric patients with TM are experiencing similar levels of general and sleep-related fatigue as compared to those with pediatric MS. And once again, this was a big eye-opening moment for me uh, reviewing this data um, and, and understanding um, the significant rates of fatigue that we see in MS. 
So these findings tell us that we really need to, in the clinic, be focusing on assessing for fatigue and thinking about um, how we can treat these symptoms. The other thing that I uh, really think is important for a team to do and for someone in my position to do is to think about the co-occurring symptoms. So there's some research to tell us that fatigue issues um, often relate to sleep issues, to pain, uh, to depression. And so psychology uh, plays an important role, I feel like, in teasing apart the fatigue versus mood-related symptoms that may be contributing. The other thing that this uh, does for me, um, I routinely work with schools on uh, treatment plans for our patients. And, you know, it's nice to have some data um, to back up our team when we write these letters to schools saying, you know, this, um, this student may need uh, frequent breaks or to go on part-time status once they've gone to college or something along those lines. So now we have some some data to support um, what we already advocate for for our patients. We can also think about ways to make daily tasks easier. So modifying our environment, um, if uh, AFOs make walking easier, wearing those AFOs, there may be some um, simple tools and tricks that we can um, employ for our patients. I think tracking fatigue throughout the day is an important thing for um, our patients to do. Some, I would say many, report that afternoon fatigue is the most uh, difficult and debilitating. And so when they get into their you know, sixth period math class, um, they're really starting to struggle. So being able to create a schedule that accommodates for those fluctuations can be a really um, effective strategy. So I'm going to kind of wrap up here with some final thoughts. Um, the summary statement is that our individuals with these rare conditions are considered to be at risk for neuropsychological difficulties, but it doesn't mean that all will be affected. There are lots of opportunities for intervention, and these have to be tailored to meet individual needs. In the small groups tomorrow, uh, Cole and I will be talking uh, in more detail about these interventions. And in case you're not signed up for those, just a high level here is really to have an assessment that is comprehensive and multidisciplinary. I think um, creating a tailored approach to care really starts with that type of assessment. There may be medications. Um, that are helpful to alleviate some of the symptoms we've talked about today. Uh, psychological support can be really um, effective. Uh, School-based services, which I've talked about some, OT and PT, and then there are some cognitive um, rehabilitation um, and other strategies that we'll dive into tomorrow. I always like to mention who might be a candidate for assessment. If any of you are sitting here wondering um, if you or your loved one might benefit from this type of evaluation, I would say that the person and uh, the, the patient and those around them who know them best are in the best position to evaluate any changes that may be seen over time and or the functional impact of the cognitive problem. So if, you know, someone is struggling with memory or paying attention, needing a lot of repetition, maybe it's getting in the way of school or work, those would be times to think about speaking to your primary physician about um, having an evaluation. The challenges that I see, there are many, um, several of these include the lack of awareness on rare conditions. I think our team and uh, all the people um, here with a TMA are working to change that. Um, there's an assumption that could be made about cognition based on physical impairment. I've had families speak to me about that um, and that that's a concern for them. On the flip side, the but you look so good phenomenon, that there's this invisible disability. Fatigue is a great example of that. Depression may be a great example of that. And so, you know, we have to work with, with schools and with other groups providing support um, to help them understand the, the true nature of these conditions and how they can show up. We really just need more research. You're going to hear that hundreds of times at this, uh, at this symposium. And I think um, one of the things we need to start doing is turning the corner and looking at interventions and how those make a difference. And some future directions here. Um, 
You know, I think there's some exciting work coming out in other populations to tell us that uh, things like um, therapy, uh, talking to someone can make a big difference in symptoms. We've known that actually for a long time. Um, other things that um, stand out as kind of emerging areas are those related to nutrition and exercise. So we're starting to see some work done on that. Imaging studies, I'm going to talk about one we're doing at Children's and UT tomorrow, I think um, are going to give us some important clues. Um, we've been talking for a long time about the effects of bringing together kids and families um, at a camp for uh, these rare conditions and the power that that has, and we have wanted to track that um, to see what kind of difference it's making. The support groups uh, in a similar way um, is a, an area that we'd like to explore. Um, you see the dog with a stethoscope. There um, is some really interesting work coming out on pet therapy. If you bring a pet therapist to a college campus during exams, you actually see uh, self-reported symptoms of depression go down. And I don't know about all of you, I'm a big dog person and I think my dogs do that for me. So that is all. Thank you.